Good evening, everyone. You're listening to Fantasmic, hosted by none other than myself, Lady Macabre. As a quick thing to note before I get on with today's show, Debauchery Diary will be making its official debut on December 13th. As a reminder, this is the show that will be very lewd in nature, given how I'll be reviewing porn games. It's still very much a project I'm excited to finally be sharing with you all, but I know you all are here for scary stories, not my personal habits. <laughs> More info can be found on Patreon or OnlyFans for those curious, though. Now then. Tonight, I wanted to take a look at what each state in America's scariest urban legend was. And while there are some that are similar in vain, i.e. multiple cases of essentially Bigfoot or Sasquatch, there were others that absolutely fascinated me while others chilled me. There were several, and I mean several, excellent choices for me to share tonight. And it's a damn shame I can only share three. So, here's what I'm planning to do. This will be a recurring episode theme from time to time. That way, I can cover all of the juiciest legends. To start us off, we are taking a look at Pennsylvania. Evidently, there is a legend that mentions a bus for lost souls. Dubbed officially as the Bus to Nowhere or the Wandering Bus, those who have claimed to have ridden the bus have all reported that there are no distinguishable factors to the bus. It just shows up, with no indicators of where it's headed or where it's been and it gives you one chance to board. The only thing on this bus is a clear Southeastern Pennsylvania Transit Authority logo. But even then, the bus can't be found on any official transit maps or company manifests. What would make someone get on this bus? Well, as it turns out, this bus is for poor, lost, wayward souls who are on their last strand of hope. The driver of the bus, while he never shows his face, seems to know just who needs a little ride around town. He does an initial drive-by, to assess one's worthiness, I suppose, before letting one on board. But if you ignore the bus, you won't get a second shot. Those who have boarded the bus say they felt compelled to, and in order to be let on, a passenger must wave down the bus on its second go, after the driver has made his presence known, and ask for the permission to be let on. Only once permission is granted will the doors open and you can climb in. Fair isn't necessary for this ride. The driver is focused only on the road and will leave his passenger to deal with their inner demons as he drives. Remember, this bus is for the desperate. Other passengers may already be on, but they are all already deep into trying to resolve their struggles. The ride is deathly quiet. And while you won't remember any of the other faces that may have been around you, it's evident that everyone on this bus is caught in their own minds. The moment you sit down, the journey begins. Those who remember the ride say that they almost immediately fall into some deep reflection that dissects the moments that led to their desperation. For a time, nothing else exists. Just you, the bus, its driver, and its passengers. Then again, I'm fairly certain that if one is in a true state of deep, intense thought, they probably aren't really paying that close of attention to the world outside. So while the bus may very well blip into its own little pocket dimension, I'm more likely to believe that the passengers are just blissfully unaware as they try to learn from the mistakes that led to their desperate journey. The length of the journey is reliant on how long it takes one to both recognize and remedy the behaviors that brought them there in the first place. This is not a short process, mind you, but typically the ride will last several hours. Although, if some cases are to be believed, it can go on for years. Riders who are successful in this, however, will be able to see the twinkling lights of the city in the distance if they look out the window. It is at this point that those who rode recall pulling the cord to let the driver know to stop, which he does by dropping you off right where he picked you up. It is at this point that ex-passengers of this bus will have either A, have completely forgotten their journey, only remembering stepping on and stepping off, b, get delivered to a point in time preceding the events that precipitated their downward spiral, giving people the chance to not only work through their past, but also relive it, or c, they gain nothing because there is simply no deliverance from whatever it is that they did to bring them to this point. For the handful of passengers that fall into that last category, this is the unfortunate outcome that is thought to be reserved for those who have committed acts against humanity for which they saw absolution. Forgiveness is powerful, 
but even the bus to nowhere proves that not everything is forgivable. For many, this bus serves as a final beacon of hope. A chance for retribution is rare, after all. But for those who can't handle their own emotions being laid out bare for themselves, it is possible to pull a string and get off prematurely. But it's reported that those who do this claim to only realize just the opportunity they lost after they got off the bus and saw him drive off. On the flip side of that, there are, of course, passengers who are incapable of learning their lesson. Those are the ones that get trapped on the bus forever, stuck to leave their friends and family wondering what became of them as the passenger strives for a breakthrough that will never come. The wandering bus is full of intrigue and, honestly, if you find yourself hopeless and dejected, wandering around Philadelphia at night, and an enigmatic bus catches your eye, well, wave it down and ask to board. Some opportunities are once in a lifetime. And this one might just be your ticket to a better future. A better you. Now, to go someplace a bit warmer. <laughs> to Hawaii, to be exact. There are all types of ghosts out there, but only in Hawaii can you find the Night Marchers. These are the ghosts of ancient warriors, and their role in the afterlife is to play vanguard for sacred kings, chiefs, or chiefesses. These spirits are quite deadly and lethal, as according to ancient folklore, one look from them will disintegrate mere mortals. Is that fate avoidable? Well, actually, yes. According to ancient Hawaiian beliefs, the sacred cannot be viewed by mortals. Whether it's their face, back, or entirety, if a mortal is caught looking, the offender is killed instantly, quote, by bolts of intense light and flaming heat originating from several of the warrior's eyes aimed toward the mortal. The violating mortal is incinerated instantly, and the bodily remains dissipate as vapors, end quote. Acts of defiance toward the Night Marchers will also grant you a violent, gruesome death, but so long as one is respectful and doesn't look at the procession, all should be well. It is common belief that, quote, if the mortal lies motionless, face down on the road, they are showing proper respect, fear, and deference to the Night Marchers. They will be spared, end quote. Alternatively, if you happen to be lucky enough to be related to one of the Night Marchers in the procession, they will call out Nau upon recognizing you, claiming you as one of theirs and thus sparing you. It is also said that planting living cordyline fruticosa, aka tea shrubs, around one's home will keep evil spirits out. Although, speaking of homes, fun fact, apparently night marchers can and will walk through houses with the front and back doors lined up perfectly straight. Who knew? Well, you should really not go out of your way to hunt these ghosts. Some classic signs that they're nearby or starting their procession include the sound of heavy footsteps or marching, chanting, the beating of war drums, the sound of a conch shell being blown, the stench of death, or the sight of lit torches. Those who have seen them up close and were lucky enough to live to tell the tale shared that while there may be the sound of marching, these specters don't actually touch the ground. Instead, they hover along and leave no traces of their visits. They're most likely to appear at night, although it has been observed that if they are escorting a dying relative to the spirit world, they may even appear in broad daylight. Night marchers are reported to be normal-sized warriors, quote-unquote, that are dressed for battle and carrying spears and clubs. They really only come out on nights celebrating the Hawaiian gods Kane, the highest of the four major deities, he was the god of procreation and was worshipped as the ancestor of chiefs and commoners, Ku, one of the four major deities, he is the god of war, politics, farming, and fishing, Lono, Again, one of the four major deities, he is the god of fertility, rainfall, music, and peace. And or Kanaloa, the last of the four major deities, he is the god of the ocean and the underworld, as well as the teacher of magic and the quote-unquote subconscious to Kane's conscious. They will either rise from the ocean or come forth from their burial sites to start their procession. The marches vary based on the taste of its honored warrior leader. For example, a leader who likes music will be honored with drums and chanting, whereas one who preferred silence would have as quiet a procession as possible. 
laws declared that some body parts of a chief or king were sacred and never to be viewed by mortals. And this would also affect the march. Quote, if a king's or chief's face was not supposed to be observed, the king or chief would lead the assembled night marchers from the front. If his back was not to be looked upon, he would be in the back of the assembled group. However, for some chiefs, no part of them was forbidden to look at by mortals. These chiefs would march among their warriors in the group, end quote. Sometimes, even the gods may join a procession. In these marches, there are five large torches carried one in front, one in the back, and three within the group. All torches will be significantly brighter in these marches. In the night marches with Hawaiian gods present, there are six gods, three male and three female. The goddess named Hayaka Ikapoli Opele, I hope I pronounced that right, I tried, uh, is often within the night marchers. The composition of night marchers is extremely varied in these instances. There are also common paths that you can try to avoid if you ever find yourself in Hawaii. All you have to do is ask the locals if they know anything about the night marchers. <laughs> Now, I do think it's about time that I discuss the last tale on my list. All the way in South Dakota, there's a legend of Walking Sam. Now, this isn't particularly that old of an urban legend, but Walking Sam is reported to be seven feet tall, with eyes but no mouth, and the corpses of his victims can be seen when he lifts his arms. He is potentially malicious, potentially just lonely and seeking companions in the wrong way, and he preys on the young. You see, Walking Sam actually appears to be an amalgamation of several different legends. One being the infamous Slenderman, which I might cover in a future episode if my little phantoms want. But for the sake of this episode, the best way to surmise him is as a tall, lanky figure with no face, but always dressed in a snazzy business suit that may or may not be his skin. The other biggest factor would be the scary stories being told to the children of Lakota households, such as the likes of suicide spirits or shadow people who attempt to lure kids and teens away from their safe homes. Which brings us to our final big key factor in this myth, the boogeyman. Typically described as a tall, lanky man donned in shadows that steals kids away, I'd say it's pretty easy to see the comparison between them all. The Legend of Walking Sam is thought to be a possible reason for so many adolescent suicide attempts in recent years for members of the Sioux living in the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. These teens are already living in a place plagued by poverty, alcoholism, and mental health struggles. It's little wonder the high school dropout rates have been rising. Being a teen, your emotions are still developing and can be very intense, as I'm sure some of you are already aware. Feelings of hopelessness can easily lead to long-term depression, and with both of those, thoughts of suicide are bound to pop up at some point for most, if not all, the adolescents who experience that vicious cycle. There have been videos that surfaced of teens showing how to tie nooses just right, and there have been trees full of ominous nooses hanging from their branches. An urban legend such as Walking Sam coming into the picture to be that final nudge as he tells his victims how worthless they are and how they'd be better off dead or how no one would even miss them. It's heart-wrenching. To the families who have been affected in any way by this, you have my sincerest condolences and I wish nothing but the best for you and all your generations to come. Mental health is very serious, as noted with the COVID bullshit that we all had to go through. If a figure like Walking Sam comes into your life to try to convince you to take your own life, please, I beg of you, let someone know. Talk to someone, please. Get help. I promise you, this life is worth so much more if you just give it a chance to prove that. The light at the end of the tunnel may not always be visible, but there will always be a guiding glimmer to lead you there. Remember that. I love you all, but that does bring us to the end of this week's episode. Of course, I have to supply some obligatory reminders, such as where you can support the show. <laughs> All links will be in the description, but you can support the project through Patreon, Coffee, or OnlyFans. If you have any story suggestions, you can always email them to me at luckymisfortune at gmail.com. That's L-U-C-K-Y-M-S-F-O-R-T-U-N-E at gmail. Or you can tweet them at misfortune4 or you can drop them off in my Discord server. 
And finally, at 500 Little Phantoms, I'll be sharing one of my own personal scary stories. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. As an extra bonus, you'll get to stay up to date with all my scary stories. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight, darlings. Are you expecting visitors? Uh, I just heard someone knocking at your door, but... Isn't it a bit late for company now? <laughs>